Um, I've worked with uh, Graham for too long now probably. We, we first went back um, around 2010 I think. Um, I just left a rather large consultancy and uh, we needed some solutions quickly and someone said yeah of course we can do that, no problem at all. <laughs> so that's how we got together. Um, not, not like me at all, I'm right. <laughs> no, not at all. But um, over the years of uh, working in various industries, which we'll talk about in a minute, there's two things that are really important. One is around processes. Everybody knows how to do a job, but doing it in a business consistency is a challenge. So I'll talk about that a little bit. But then the value of data. Alex actually mentioned quite some important things. Is that there's a huge amount of data that's floating around now. And what I'll try and talk about is from clear processes, you can produce data which can allow you to improve how you operate. And it'll become more clear as we go through. So just a little bit of um, history about our business. So my colleague Mark Pyra is here with me today. Mark's a, a, a very experienced lean engineer and, uh, and consultant. And what we find is a lot of the businesses that we work in actually operate in very uncontrolled and un, unmanaged ways. And we, we come in and look at how the business, we can bring it to develop processes for the business. It's the simple things they'll become apparent through the talk. Um, my background is I'm, I'm actually a railway signal engineer, but I went from guided missiles to unguided missiles. So I transferred railway to highways, and I think it was mentioned earlier, we've worked in the gambling industry. All of the industries we work in, whether it's the water industry, the highways industry, the rail industry, and do some work for the NOD and people like that, it's all about people understanding what tasks they're responsible for, what their role is and what responsibility is, and then looking for the best way of doing it and making sure you're consistent with it. Because sometimes the mavericks mean the biggest risk in the business and the biggest losses to the business. So we'll talk about processes as we go through. Um, what's become apparent is there's a, a, a there's a lot of information available, but it's exploiting that information. So things like data analytics and operational business improvements, small improvements. If you look at Formula One teams, they spend millions on a hundredth of a second. We're not saying that about the highways industry. We're actually saying with some improvements, you can save yourself a lot of money. But it's identifying how you do that. And then how do you improve it again? How do you keep it moving through? So start to talk a little bit about how um, the technology that's available to you through my mobile workers you you some of you've got it and some of you looking at it but what we've found over the years is that the technology brings us clear ways of doing things you can record it you can monitor it and you can manage it it's a good phrase to use record monitor manage and that final word which is improve because once you know what you're doing and how it's been done and how efficiently it's been done, then you can say, I can make that better. And that's the Formula One thing. Hundreds of the seconds or thousands of the second by making a two million pound wing that goes on the front. I'm not proposing that for you guys. <laughs> the big thing now though is it's automated data collection. Where before you get someone to type something in or do something, actually the devices we've got nowadays, again, now I mentioned it, they're doing things for us. So where before the challenge was, oh, we've got all this data, what can we do with it? Now we can actually automate it, the capture, and then what you want to know is the exception. What's the important thing? I think a lot of, has been mentioned already, efficiency, transparency, the ability to act before the problem occurs. Hopefully, we'll, we'll get a bit out about how that's important to businesses, because if you can start to give your customers confidence, it was mentioned earlier on, and reduce your costs, you get more work. Simple as that. Everybody is looking for a, a cheaper operation, but more importantly, a reliable and a safe operation. So again, let's try and pull some of that out as we go through. It's a bold statement at the top. Um, you don't all exploit it. The businesses Mark and I go into, one we're working on at the moment, hundreds of millions of pounds spent in technology but the guys don't switch the devices on anymore. It's 
as simple as that. It, it, it's, it, it's a crazy situation. And the highways industry, again, you invest, the highways England are terribly investing in processes, but then change how they use them going down it. And oh, yeah, we don't need to do that, but it's about trying to look at how we can get the true value out of processes. So, what a process will do, and a clear set of processes that are well documented, easy to read, simple to understand, will start to give you safe approaches to how you work on a highway. I mentioned I come from the rail industry, and in, in some of the early years I worked in there, they had a terrible reputation. But they engineered out the problems from knowledge. If you've got someone who's making a mistake, and you can see it, you can prevent your other colleagues and your other workforce making that same mistake. So a lot around consistent, safe approach. And the other thing is, if you've got a guy who's found a way of doing something really well, and it saves your business time and prevents accidents happening, how do you then get that across to everyone else? You can identify the processes and the things that to take that through. Efficient delivery and process compliance. Sometimes it's hard. You see someone who's done something for 30 years, and I'll give you a little anecdote. The East Coast Main Line railway line, a fantastically well-run railway line in the period. They had a hero, a guy called Barry Evans. Barry Evans was the best technician on the East Coast Main Line. Any train failure, any signaling failures, Barry was out there, trains were moving in 10 minutes. A guy called John Hartley. Steady away, sat in the corner, quietest guy in all of the operations. When John went out, it took him three times longer than Barry to repair a fault. Three times longer. Barry was on a pedestal up here as being Barry fix it. Barry can do everything. He was the best guy. What the rest of the business now, and so all the managers, everybody. Main line comes to check. One, two, three, four, four five, 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 six, seven, eight, nine, sorry, nine, 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 ten. When we started recalling performance information about when failures occurred, we started to see a little bit of a different picture of Barry. Barry would charge out there, I'm the hero, bang, 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 crash while the trains would move. Every time Barry went to a failure, four other people had to go back and mop up the crap that he caused, because he bodged it. John Hartley went to a job, he was always 10 minutes slower, but nothing ever failed after John went there. So how do you go back to this industry that's got a hero on a pedestal, fastest guy who repairs everything, against a guy who's 10 minutes longer, costs more in train delay, data, information, showing what it's done. Turned out Barry had never been on a single training course. Every training course come up, no, I can't be asked to go on that, I know what I'm doing. But that's the power of data and using the technology and the process. Main line technology check. One, two, three, four, What's the best five, six, seven, eight, nine, so, eight, ten. It's strange that you see a, a guy on a pedestal and you get a guy at the bottom. John Harley became a bit more of a hero. Barry went on a lot of training courses. He couldn't hack it. He retired. He packed it. That's where this proactive management takes place in real time. That's where you're looking at performance from process and data. So hopefully it's useful for you to understand that if you get that clear process and you can follow those steps, you can measure what people are doing. Remember the record, monitor, manage, measure and improve. So, I'll give Mark the credit for some of this because I need some of his slides. But, um, it's establishing a standard. It doesn't have to be complicated. You all have ways of working today, and the best way, just establish it. Just publish it. Just tell people what it is. Um, without standards, you can't improve it. It's this bit that's really important, because if you've got something, you can say, we get this productivity or we get this achievement from this standard, we can improve it. If you just keep varying what you're doing, you can't actually see what the value is. Um, the other thing is, when you've got a set of processes, you can start to reduce the steps. You can say, well, why are we doing that? Is it better if we don't do that? Let's take that out and see what effect it has. It's just clear I do it. I think the other thing that's really important is, I mentioned that I'm not going to cover every bit because you'll get the presentation, but it's it's... Compressing the end-to-end -end time and eliminating errors and, and, and making sure people 
understand what they're responsible for and, and how they do it. Um, training always comes in. How do you train your people if you don't have a set of processes and standards? Is it peer training? Well, if that guy's got a bad way of doing something, you've just peer trained the rest of the people you've trained. It's that consistency again. And, and sometimes peer training can be um, Barry-esque. Hit it with hammer, mate. <laughs> and that's the answer, isn't it? But every time he hit a thread with a hammer, he buggered the thread. But he told a lot of apprentices that was the best way to do it. So the clear process is, is it gives you the drive. And the final one on this slide is about establishing your performance measures. Performance indicators come from, I expect this to be done in this amount of time and that's what it will produce. And you can be clear with everybody what they're, they're going to deliver. Um, there's a bit of a difference between a process and instructions. And I think it's important to understand that process defines the specific ways which are policies are enacted. So there's rules that you guys work to in the highways industry, but what we're saying with the process is what has been done by whom and when and in what sequence. If you've got a, a legislative policy, it should be visible in the process and who's responsible for it. So I thought I'd put that in. Um, and then that drives you some structure to ownership, training and competency, and the process confirmation. Process confirmation is about line managers making sure that the business process that you've all signed off, you've agreed to, that's how we're going to work, is being followed. And if you've got that old maverick in there, who is either costing you more or putting your business at risk, it might not show us cost at first, but the risk is you have a massive incident and it costs you a lot of money. So that confirmation and process bit, it's clear, it's a line manager's role. This is what our business does, this is how we do it. And that's where the mobile workers' devices come in. It enforces some of that, takes out the supervisors going out and doing random checks and whatever. It automates it. And if you see non-compliance, you can get back in and that saves you a time. And then it's about building it into the routine. Every time you go to a job, someone knows what they've got to do. So, that's the boring talk. Processes don't have to be hard. You start off with a load of people in a room, a load of post-it notes, and say, what do we do? It's really simple. But then you start to tidy it up a little bit, and you say, right, what are the values of the steps? What's the important thing? And then what you really end up with is a very simple process map like this. There can be lots of different formats, whatever people are comfortable working. But it's simple. There's the role. There's the and then the individual items of the tasks, and you know who's responsible for them. So the development processes should be hard, but what they do is bring standards to a business. Once we've got processes sorted out, this is the next bit of what I'll rumble through, is about using the data. It's about, once you've got those processes in place, you can capture information. Alex mentioned the device information, my mobile workers, there's a lot of information in the background. But technology around data in the last couple of years has moved on hugely. You watch, that does my heartbeat. My wife gets worried about me, sends me to hospital. Wouldn't let her see the data. Because she would. Um, my phone measures gas sensing. There's lots of different technology. You hear the term Internet of Things. If it moves, if it breathes, if it even vibrates, we can put a sensor, on it, a sensor on it now and get data from it. But it used to be a massive challenge of what you did with all this data. What we've got now is the ability to automate intelligent analytics and only tell you the things you really need to know. So let, let the technology do all the bits in the background. But if one of your guys goes into a dangerous place, you want to know about it, don't you? And that's the great thing with technology now. It allows us to look at all of these things very simply. Without masses of delving into spreadsheets and handheld reports coming back or what Graham's data comes back to you, we can automate that and only tell you about the things that you really need to know that will affect your business or if someone's not following your business process. So that's why processes are important to establish first. 
So, you can't really see it on here, but this is a map of telemetry and data from existing systems. This is the Internet of Things, and, and you can have a sensor for just about everything now. If you can have a sensor for someone standing up, laying down, you can program it, you can do just about anything. If you want to know if they're using vibration equipment, yeah, bolt one on the side, tells you how long it is, uh, been operating the machine, all of that's there. But all of that data's got to go somewhere, it used to cost a lot of money, it doesn't anymore. What you want to know is if someone's exposed to, say, a hand-arm vibration scenario for more than X. And those systems are easy now to put in place, so you can automate them and, and take them back. Um, as I say, it's not very clear on here, but when you see the picture, you can get it. I think the most important thing in here is things like reducing admin times, greater efficiency. Reducing admin times come from knowing when the ignition case turned on the vehicle. I think it was interesting when Alex was saying about the, um, uh, the device that didn't work. Back in the rail industry a few years ago, we had actually had the first faxed ignition key. We used to send our work out to guys to do their daily um, maintenance routines on a fax machine. And I will mention the name where it is because we're far enough away. The technicians in Darlington, if they didn't get a fax, nothing moved. What they did develop was the best way to bugger up a fax machine ever. <laughs> they cut the line, they took the power out. We put it in a steel cabinet with a pot out of the top, they cut the wire down outside. But what they got the point was that this was a way of them sitting in a mess room and having coffee or something. Because <coughs> the business had given them a routine to follow and they thought, oh, well, we'll do it a different way. But now, that doesn't really apply anymore because there are so many, as Alex said, so many different ways of getting information to people, but there's also so many ways of different capturing it. I can't implant a tracking device in the body of anybody yet, I'd love to try, but I can't, but very, very few people leave their mobile phone laying around. These things are an incredible source of data, as, as we said earlier. How many of you use um, Google Timeline? Have any of you seen it? Google Timeline tracks all the time. I, when I'm doing my invoicing or expenses, I just go to my timeline and I see where I went, and it tracks it. It's free. It's in there, but very people use it. Very few people know it exists or use it. It's the same with a lot of data and technology that comes through. So, what's changed is this bit here: the smartphone data, abundant information, just talked about. It. It's the, it's the automated analytics now. Um, artificial intelligence, you've heard about it, there's lots of stories about it. But the reality is if you've got a massive database, you can ask it questions. That's the simplest way of doing it. And if you've got some questions you want to ask, the data is freely available. So just think about it from that point of view. If you say, I want to know every time someone leaves a depot and what time they get to their first job. That's artificial intelligence. You can set a parameter that says, if it takes more than an hour, find out why. It's that kind of thing. It's using the smarts of the system. When you look at it, when you collect data, it's used to improve your processes. So the great quote there is, the more data Tesla gathers about cars, the better it improves the cars. It improves the distance it travels, and it improves the safety systems on the, on the, on the cars. And Tesla does have an incredibly good safety record because it improves all the time. So it's useful to know that even with the kit you've got, you can gather information, at a very low cost, you can interrogate it, but you can always improve. Hopefully that's useful. Um, a lot of companies are not very good at being data-driven, and the reason they're not good at data-driven is because it's all hidden away. Piles of data on spreadsheets, We've recently worked with a company who had piles of data on paper. They had safety critical signalling information being recorded on paper and scanned and put in a digital store. You can't interrogate it. It's not useful data. But if an incident occurred on the railway, someone would have had to pour over all of these digitally stored pictures of data that was really important. So think about it in a way of, all of that information was valuable information, 
but it was being lost because someone said, oh, I've got a really good idea, we'll scan all of those report <coughs> sheets and store it digitally. Bloody useless. Mm -hmm. It's simple to go to someone like Graham and say, give me a digital form. Digital form produces data, the data, you might never look at it, but you might have a trigger point that says, I need to know about that. A little bit of intelligence. Um, we're more and more now um, reliant on things like BIM. Everybody's heard the phrase BIM, yeah? People are aware of it? What does it really mean? What does it mean to your industry? Anyone? A comment on, on people saying that I need a BIM compliant design or something like that? Have you heard of it? I won't hammer it much then, but BIM is a standard of, for digital data in design and construction. What it means is that you can extract data from a design drawing or you can extract data from a plan and you can use it centrally. That will become the most important thing very soon that that central database from the BIM system that says this design is going to have this element, it'll get other information from building information systems or internet sensors things in roads or wherever and it will compare it to what the design was in the first place. That's where artificial intelligence will become really important because people will be comparing about how many times you go to maintain something, how many times you're actually going to use. Did it marry up to what you're, you said it was, it was going to last five years? You're replacing it in two. It's that kind of thing that's going to come along and that's going to become more important. And the highways industry is becoming more and more data driven. If you look at the things you have to supply back to HE, if you work in the Highways England or, uh, uh, environment, they're asking for so much more about safety information, about productive information, plant labour materials, all of that. The idea of collecting automated data without people having to physically put information in will become more important and reduce your costs at the end. Um, I think the data from the processes, and I'm definitely getting to the end now, is about real-time data as well. I don't know how many of your clients are saying to you, I want to know when you're doing something. We're finding in a lot of the industries that we work in, people want, they expect now, more real-time information. That real-time information has got to be the right information. So that, again, right back to the start about the processes. Set up your processes to allow you to understand what you need to capture and why it's captured, but then where it's going to go. Because again, if you've got someone who's non-compliant and you've got real-time data, someone else will spot it before you do, I guarantee it. So the processes drive the real-time data. Um, <coughs> proactivity, giving people the visibility of something before they make a mistake. The usual comment <coughs> is, Oh, I thought I'd known that. Actually, they can now. If you have something, knowledge base or history of something before someone does a job and make it easily available to them, you're being proactive. You're saying, check this before you do it so we don't make a mistake. This is the way we do it. You've got the process. Well, there's the process step. Show the person on the My Mobile device what the process step is and what's expected of them. It allows people to become much more reliant on information rather than what Barry told him to hit with a hammer 10 years ago because that was the best way of doing it. So that proactiveness is, is quite important. Um, I think the visualisation of data, uh, Graham mentioned about maps. Visualisation of data is now becoming unexpected as well. Where are they? What are they doing? <laughs> what kit they got on the lorry? All of the other bits and pieces. All very simple to capture and do but worth having. It doesn't cost a lot to actually produce. It's back to this point about exceptions. If a lorry goes out of the yard without enough kit on it, that's an exception. You need to know about that. So why don't you set the system up to tell you? So you can't make the mistake. Um, and I, I come back to this artificial intelligence bit. It is becoming so easy to use artificial intelligence to improve things. So a couple of conclusions, really. Um, Connect your people and your clients. Get the data moving from the cold face to the person. The more confidence you give your client, the less they'll leave you, the more they'll leave you alone. They'll trust you, they'll rely on you. Um, share knowledge. Why hide? If you've got 
a lorry with a load of equipment on it and it's got all of the bits that you need to do. If you show your client you're ready and available and you've got that equipment, great, the client will trust you again and more, more from you. Um, if you've got information and you've got those clear processes, you can make more informed real-time decisions. Again, your client sees you as a person they can trust. Um, and the reliability of the service as well. If they see that every time they ask, you respond, and you do it properly and efficiently, because you do it consistently, it's not different when Fred turns up and Graham turns up, it's always a consistent service. You'll end up with more, more work, I'll show you. Um, the technology and application moving in highways, there is so much that's gonna come around soon around automation. You guys work a lot in the traffic light industry, I assume traffic management. One of the businesses I'm heavily involved in are working quite heavily to deal with the issue around um, local authorities and utilities. We were talking about it earlier on about your local authorities and utilities now demanding manned solutions, people making decisions about traffic lights. Actually, what we've got is the ability to use things like video analytics, automated traffic counts. We can centralise some of these operations and become more <coughs> cost effective because the technology is no longer the challenge. It's the processes you want to work to. Whatever you can think of, most people in technology might say, yeah, we can do that. What we've got to get right is the most efficient way of doing something, the best way of doing something, and use the technology to apply that. So if you look at, I don't know, you might have 20 sites out a day, um, the local authority or utilities have said, I need those men, I need traffic counts, and I need no more than 10 cars in a queue. Why don't we automate that? Why don't we make intelligence and get the client to understand that the systems are available now for us to be able to do that? You can think, oh, Christ, that's going to knock our revenue. But if you've got the technology, you might be the only one in business. It's that kind of thing where you've got to start thinking forward about what technology is available. And believe me, it is available. So there's a lot of things to do with that. And that comes from artificial intelligence. You've got a camera that looks forward using video analytics. It sees more than five cars in a queue, and it sees another the other way. That's artificial intelligence is best. If you've got a traffic count system further down, you can say, right, give us a different tolerance, a different working arrangement. That's all artificial intelligence. It's only doing what the guy stood there, being paid a couple of hundred quid a day to stand there, would be doing. But you can feed that all back to a central control room and have one operative managing 10, 20, 30, whatever number of sites. But the artificial intelligence is doing it and he only has to intervene when there's two cars that crash together because a couple of numbers decide to jump the lights. But then you can tell the client we've just had an incident. It's that kind of thing where you use technology to make things better. That's about it really. Um, Hopefully, the bit about processes is about understanding, unless you get those standards in place, you won't improve what you do. It has to be clear everybody understands what their roles and responsibilities are. And the second thing is, technology is no challenge anymore. You've just got to tell us what we want to do with that technology, what we want to do with that data, what's really important, how can we improve those processes. So they're both linked. Hope it's useful. Um, it's a different insight into bringing maybe your industry up to some of the other industries that are there. We mentioned logistics earlier, I think we talked about warehouses and things like that. If you see what those guys are doing with technology now, it, it blows my mind away and I've been in technology for a long time. So let's just try and explore some of it in your industry. Brilliant, okay. thank you Brian.